Hillsdale K-12 education, what the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum is, how it came about, and its underlying principles. Dr. O'Toole. Hey, thanks, Jordan, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, I'm just, just scrolling through the list of people who are here, and I see some familiar names. So whether you're in the process of starting a Hillsdale affiliated school or a teacher or a former teacher in those schools, I especially welcome you. Um, I have a couple of jobs this morning as Jordan, or this afternoon actually, as Jordan said. Um, the first one is to tell you about Hillsdale College and our work in K through 12 education. And then I'd like to give you an introduction to the 1776 curriculum, talk to you about what it is, where it came from, uh, and then I'll send it back to Jordan who will take you through the curriculum and give you a tour. Um, we are very eager for your questions. Part of the goal here is to help people who are interested in using the curriculum or curious about its purposes understand it. And so please do use that Q&A or that chat and we'll allow plenty of time for questions at the end. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk to you about K-12 education at Hillsdale College. And I'm gonna do that with the help of a very handy visual aid, which is gonna pop up in just a second. Hillsdale College, as you uh, may know, is, um, is an old institution and an unusual institution. Jordan, can you confirm that everyone can see that okay? Yeah, that's right, it's up. Okay, great. Um, so Hillsdale College is a liberal arts college in Southern Michigan. We are um, 177 years old. We're in our 177th year. Our roots are in uh, Free Will Baptists who started this school. Uh, we are famous for sending nearly all of our student body to fight in the, in the Civil War. Um, so campus just completely emptied of, uh, of young men during the, uh, during the Civil War. And uh, that's partly because the roots of the, of the college are abolitionist roots. If you look at a picture of the first graduating class of Hillsdale College, there are women in that class and there's an African-American man in that class. And that was basically unheard of in American colleges at the time. Um, and that has to do with our idea going back to the very beginning that the very best education should be available to everyone. Today, Hillsdale College is remarkable because of its refusal to accept federal funds that allows us to, or state funds, that, also, that allows us to be truly independent uh, when we, we have the freedom here to say what we think and to do what we think is right. And um, all of our work is made possible by friends of the college who believe in its mission. Uh, what that means is that Hillsdale College is involved in a lot more than just the education of undergraduates although and graduate students, although that is, of course, our primary purpose and the, the reason that we exist day in and day out. Uh, we have 1,500 students here at the college and two graduate schools, one more graduate program on the way. And um, in addition to that, we host online courses which are free and enjoyed by adults and children uh, across the country. And we also have been working in K through 12 education for a long time, which is our subject today. Hillsdale College um, has been working in K-12 education for 30 years, just over 30 years. We have a private cr uh, classical school here on campus called Hillsdale Academy. And we have uh, for over 10 years now, been working through the Barney Charter School Initiative to help local groups of citizens start classical schools, originally charter schools, but now charter and private schools that bring the same education in the liberal arts and sciences that our undergraduate and graduate students receive to K-12 students. Uh, my own, my own um, work with Hillsdale College began when I was the founding headmaster of one of these classical schools. And um, today I, I lead these efforts and uh, help the college be as effective as possible with our outreach to K through 12. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether it's going well. We try hard. Here at the college, we believe that every American student deserves the very best education that exists. Um, we think that the very best curriculum, the very best works that have ever been, that have ever been written, uh, the very best um, methods that have ever been discovered for teaching and uh, the very best teachers um, should be in front of every American student. 
And so we work hard through the, through the Barney Charter School Initiative and our other work to make this American classical education, we call it, uh, available to students, of, students in every neighborhood, students of every background. Uh, we want the schools that we work with to be excellent in their teaching, of course, in what they teach and how they teach it, but also in their operations. So we work with groups to make sure that the institutions that they, st they are starting are sound institutions, institutions that will stand the test of time. And our goal is that students receive this well-rounded education in the liberal arts and the sciences, not a career-focused education or a specific type of training, but rather an education that will provide them with knowledge of themselves, knowledge of the world around them, so that when they reach college and adulthood and whatever comes after K through 12, they have a solid foundation from which to proceed. We also recognize that students don't just learn content or information while they're in school. If you visit a Hillsdale school, you'll see that kids are learning real science, real history, real literature from the very earliest days of kindergarten. But we don't think that our job is merely to fill their minds full of information. Uh, we also recognize that as you go through your K through 12 years, you as a student are turning into the person that you are going to become. You're receiving a moral education, an idea about what is right and what is wrong, an idea about how you should live your life. And every student receives this education from his or her school and family, whether or not the school intends to give it. Uh, by sending your child to a school, you're sending your child to an, a, a group of adults and children who are going to teach that child big things about right and wrong, uh, whether well or not well. So we think since they're going to learn so much about how to live and what is choice worthy in life, and since their characters are gonna be transforming so dramatically over the course of their education, we should pay attention to the content of that education. We should make sure that we're teaching young men and women to be people of character, people of virtue, people who don't just know things and know how to think, but people who are solid and will make choices that are good for themselves and good for those who are around them. So that's a little bit about our mission. Um, it's happening in schools across the country and it's a very exciting thing to see. Um, on the topic of education, um, I wanted to point something out about education. This is a quotation from a speech that Frederick Douglass gave. Um, if you know anything about the story of Frederick Douglass, you know that he was, uh, he's a remarkable person and even more remarkable when you consider his beginnings. Um, he visited Hillsdale College in the early days and one of the most famous pictures of him that's ever been taken was taken here on campus. And we have an original of it in our archives, which is uh, pretty amazing. We don't know where he gave this speech exactly, but it's possible that he gave this speech at Hillsdale College. And we hope that he did uh, because it's, it's got some beautiful lines in it. Uh, one of the things that he, <clears throat> he spoke about was the nature of education. And he said that Education is freedom. Education means emancipation. It means taking the soul of an individual human being and raising that person up into the light of truth. It means taking what we are naturally and helping us become more than that by exposing us to something that is greater and better than ourselves. He went on to say that denying this education, preventing people from having this opportunity is one of the greatest crimes against human nature. Uh, we agree with Douglas and we think that if students are not educated properly, then their possibilities in life are limited in the most fundamental way. And so for us, this mission is an urgent mission. Um, it's a mission of the utmost importance. And um, it's something that I think, um, I think that um, we, are, we are seeing uh, among parents and among teachers in this country kind of a renewed attention to, and we think that's a very good thing. <clears throat> Let me tell you about Hillsdale's work with all of these classical schools we work with. They are all over the country and they're in every type of neighborhood you can imagine. And they're very different from each other, except that they are all faithful to this mission of bringing the liberal arts and sciences, bringing this curriculum and this way of teaching classically to, to the students and the families that they serve. Today, we're working with 49 schools across the country 
20 of these are what we call member schools. These are schools that we have helped to found, schools that we, we worked with from the very beginning to establish. And uh, they've, you know, they're of various ages. Some of them are very new. Some of them are more established. And although we don't own or operate any of these schools, we work extremely closely with their boards, with their teachers, with their principals, and we feel a great deal of responsibility for their success. Uh, we have a team of people here at the college who's constantly on the road visiting these schools. They come here to the college for conferences all the time. And we're in a giant discussion with each other all the time about how to educate young people using the very best curriculum and the very best teaching. We, uh, we learned, we've been going for 12 years in the Barney Charter School Initiative. And one of the things that we've learned is that there are a lot of schools out there both private schools and public schools that want to be more classical. They want to do classical education. And they've been knocking on our door for a decade now saying, can you, you know, can we come too? <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing. Um, and so eventually we figured out a way to help schools that already exist benefit from a lot of the resources that we provide here at Hillsdale, including among or above all the curriculum. Um, and so we have 29 schools across the country and more applying every month to use this K through 12 curriculum that we teach in our schools. Um, it's an excellent curriculum and uh, it provides both to use teacher speak vertical and horizontal alignment for the school. It's a way for a school to make sure that what it's doing with its youngest students is paving the way for what happens with older students. And it's a way for the entire school to be in a conversation with itself about what is taught and how should that be taught. Sometimes these things are left up to individual teachers or school becomes very disjointed and segmented. And our curriculum, in addition to being excellent, is uh, cohesive. It allows the entity, the school, to function as a cohesive whole. Let me show you where our schools are. Uh, they're all over the country. Um, you'll see here schools with flags. Those are our member schools. Those are schools we have helped to found. And if they have a gray flag, then we're working now to help found them. We've got board members from many of these schools on campus right now uh, doing, a, doing one of our semi-annual board development sessions. So we're actively working with the people across the country who are founding those schools with the gray flags. If you see a uh, blue dot, that's a school that pre-existed uh, before they started working with us, but that wants to become more classical in some way. Uh, these schools uh, learn from this curriculum. They use it in whatever way is helpful to them. And if they want to, um, if they want to you know, apply for membership in our initiatives and begin you know, coming to our conferences and receiving feedback and visits from Hillsdale's team. After using the curriculum for a couple of years, they can apply for that. And uh, that's a way for us to, we hope, um, do, do good things for K-12 education across the country. Before I move on, let me just mention that all of these schools are independent. We don't own or operate any of them, except for Hillsdale Academy, which is part of Hillsdale College. Um, in addition to that, all of the work that we do with these schools is provided at zero cost to the schools. Uh, we don't charge for our curriculum. We don't charge for any of the conferences or the services that we provide. All we do is ask for the biggest thing of all, which is that they do everything with excellence. Our work's made possible completely by donations to the college from people who want to see this mission spread throughout the K through 12 world. And so if you are a member of a school, a teacher in a school, and you would like to learn more about classical education, I hope you will reach out to us because we'd love to talk to you and uh, help if there's a way for us to do that. Our email address is k12k12 at hillsdale.edu. Let me talk to you about the content of this curriculum and then I'll give you an introduction to our 1776 curriculum. We describe the education that students receive in Hillsdale Classical Schools as American classical education. It's classical education steeped in um, the liberal arts and sciences and having its root in you know, the ancient world and the medieval world. 
but it's attentive to the particular situation that we find ourselves in and that our students must take account for, to account of, as they prepare for adulthood. We are Americans, and that means a few things, which I will describe briefly. Briefly, briefly speaking, um, when you look at a school that's providing this American classical education, you'll see a few things. You'll see a return to tried and true methods. In Hillsdale's classical schools, students know how to write in cursive. They know how to diagram sentences. They memorize their math facts and they don't rely on a calculator for simple equations or simple calculations. Uh, they know how to um, memorize poetry and memorize speeches and they have memorized over the course of their education some poems and some speeches and some excerpts from documents that are essential for human beings to just know without having to look up. Uh, these are schools where teachers know their stuff. We hire teachers who are highly educated, who are deeply knowledgeable about their subject area. And we create a classroom environment or allow them to create a classroom environment in which they can really teach. Uh, prudently, based on the students who are in their care, but also based on their deep knowledge of the subjects that they're teaching. This classical education is an education in skills, in knowledge, and in virtue. Kids in our schools um, learn all of the skills that you have to know to be an educated person. They learn how to read, they learn how to write, they learn how to take notes and listen and study. And we understand that those things have to be taught explicitly. We also recognize that these things are more enjoyable to learn and that the student um, is more successful in school if the student has interesting things to learn about. So these are schools where real knowledge is being, being gained from the various early, very earliest grades. Um, we study real history in kindergarten. Um, we learn real things about science. We read novels. Um, and we read the entirety of the novel rather than a summary or an excerpt of the novel because it's better to do it the real way. Um, we think that it's important not to take shortcuts with a child's education and that although not taking shortcuts is not the easiest way to do it, it's the most delightful way to do it and it's the way that actually works for both the school and the child. And so we find that in these schools, although students are reading more difficult things, they're also enjoying themselves more than they would with less interesting material. And finally, these are schools where we teach virtue. We pay attention to the type of people that these students are becoming. We want them to know themselves. We want them be, to be able to make choices that make sense. And we want them to be people of character. This is a well-rounded education covering both the humanities and the sciences. It's not an education that trains students for a particular career or a particular academic focus. We think there's plenty of time for that after your K through 12 years. And we think that any attempt to try to do that when a student is still young and in development may not work and B may limit the student ultimately. And finally, this education is a preparation for citizenship in this country. And let me tell you a little bit about why that is. And I'm gonna do it by describing the curriculum to you. Hillsdale's 1776 curriculum is the way that we've been teaching American history, American government and civics to students in K through 12 grades K through 12 for all of our time in K-12 education for over 30 years. Uh, we saw, like everyone saw over the last couple of years, that there is a massive debate going on about how students should be taught history. And at the center of the debate is a disagreement about what it means to be an American and the very goodness of our American founding. Um, that's a fundamental question for anyone who's an American, because if there's something fundamentally wrong with our founding, that means there's something fundamentally wrong with our country and with us. And so it's urgent for us as Americans to know, is our founding a good founding or not? The good news about studying the American founding and American history is that it didn't happen that long ago. 
And there's a lot of evidence that we have to understand it. The people who made this country happen did so by speaking with each other and debating with each other and writing down what they thought and keeping records of their debates. And so we think that the first and most important way for students to understand themselves as Americans is to look at what they wrote, look at the evidence. We created the curriculum by taking the scope and sequence for American history, civics and government out of our K-12 program guide, taking the same curriculum that's being taught in Hillsdale affiliated schools and adding lesson plans, sample tests and quizzes and a whole bunch of other resources to it to make it usable for any American teacher, any American parent who is looking to make sure their child receives a great education. This curriculum is created by real teachers and it's being used with real students and has been used with success by real students for over several decades. Um, and so this curriculum is reflective of what happens in Hillsdale affiliated schools and what could happen with any American student with the right curriculum and the right teaching. Let me close by talking to you about some of the principles upon which this curriculum was based. Um, we believe that politics is important. And we also believe that when we say the word politics, we often think the latest presidential election or whatever's being covered on CNN right now. Um, at its heart, that's not what politics is. Politics is the study of human beings in communities. Aristotle held that human beings are meant to live together. It's natural for us to sort ourselves together in community. And in other words, living alone for your entire life on an island is not a full human life. We're meant to be together. And it's important that the, the laws and the organization of the communities that we find ourselves in are done right because the nature of the community that we're in has a lot to do or a lot to say about the course of our individual life. We, if we lived in a despotism, it would prevent us from fully becoming ourselves as human beings. Um, look at the history of any civilization, <laughs> look at world history to learn about the evils of bad laws, the evils of bad regimes and how terrible it is to live in one as an individual human being. So we recognize the importance of politics, meaning the study of how human beings can live together justly. And we recognize that we've got to get that question right for our own individual happiness. The second thing we think is that America is important, not just because it's ours and because we know it, but because it is the only civilization, if you look at world history, to have begun because of an idea or a conversation about that very question. What makes politics, what makes human community just or not just? And if you study our American founding, it's unlike studying the founding of any other country. There are documents and ideas and intelligent people debating that very question and then coming to an answer about it and crafting a government or a system of government based upon that answer. That's rare and unique and unprecedented. It was unprecedented at its time. And so there's something, there's something special about that and something worth preserving about that. Does that mean that everything in American history is good and that we should be proud of everything that has happened in this country? Absolutely not. Um, Hillsdale, or Hillsdale College recognizes something that we all know as American citizens, that there are moments in our history that we should be ashamed of, that we should be, that we should be sad about, and that we should try to correct in the future. But we also recognize that all of those injustices happened in the context of a regime that was unlike any other. And that at the very foundation of the regime in the Declaration of Independence was a statement about human equality and the relationship between human beings and government that paves the way for those injustices to be dealt with. And so we think not only is America important, not just because it's ours, but because it's good, um, it's rare and it must be preserved. 
um, the things that are good about it must be saved and the things that need to be improved about it must be improved. But knowing how to do that as an adult begins first and all, first of all, with an excellent K-12 education in what America is. And among that, as part of that, is a, um, is a study, an honest and thorough study of American history and government. If you read the news about the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum, you'll see a lot of headlines, even in friendly papers or friendly outlets that say that it's a counterweight to the 1619 project. And that is just absolutely not true. Um, this is a different kind of thing than curricula that aim to teach students a particular um, truth about America and to cause them to do a particular set of things as a result of that education. If you look at the curriculum, which you'll get a chance to do in just a second, you'll see that it's primarily primary source documents and questions. This is not a curriculum that has made up its mind already. This is a curriculum that invites students to ask the big questions and to answer those questions responsibly based upon their knowledge. It's something that we think every American kid can do. We've seen American kids in every type of setting do this and benefit from it. And uh, we hope it's something that ends up being helpful to you, whether you're a parent, a teacher, or somehow involved in K-12 education. Thanks so much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer your questions. And I'll send it back to Jordan, who's going to give us a brief tour of the curriculum. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. O'Toole. Uh, yeah, if you have a, if you have a, any questions, reminder to put them into the Q and A box, and uh, along with your first name and where you're joining us from, and uh, and we'll we'll get to those uh, towards the end of this call. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, we'd like to take some time and actually dive into the curriculum and, and see what's here. So. Um, again, as Dr. O'Toole mentioned, it's available for free download at k12.hillsdale.edu. Um, and so at, at this point, I'd like to uh, take a look at, at, at what we have um, and what we've made available. So uh, the, the first thing that I'd like to direct this towards is, is the, the introduction to the, to the curriculum. Um, uh, this is made, meant uh, in part for teachers because this will help them to, uh, to know how to implement it in the classrooms. But it's also just for the general public and anybody who has an interest in in this in restoring American uh, education, particularly in civics and history. And so I would just be encourage uh, all of you who are on, who are on the call and, um, and and others to to look at it, to look at the different sections, and uh, and and kind of familiarize yourselves with the principles behind it and how it's how it's laid out. Um, so we have a number of different sections in here. Some things that I'd like to, to highlight uh, off the top is um, we have one on, on content on, on about uh, how do we determine what made it into the curriculum? And the issue here for those who are in, are in good faith is, is we don't only have so many years, uh, not everything can make it into 13 years of schooling. So what, what we have to, we have to choose, right? And, uh, but we, we shun a few ways that, uh, that people are using nowadays in order to choose what what their students learn, and one of those things is um, is putting some sort of lens onto the history. Uh, uh, very popular right now to put a lens on it that views everything in America in a critical light and only focuses on the ways in which her citizens or laws have come up short uh, against the principles on which she was founded. But uh, that that skews it. That's only that's going to give you a distorted view of your country and certainly one that um, cannot cannot lead to any sort of, of, of love of country, uh, even while acknowledging faults. Another one is to focus on the color of one's skin, uh, either it's of historical figures or of the students. And then um, the third one that's pretty popular is curricula that don't even teach about history, really civics, but just about current events and then actually give students ways to take action on those events in the classrooms um, and outside of school into, in the political arena. And that, that one just teaches uh, students to be pawns uh, to, to adults who have different agendas. So this curriculum rejects all those. And as Dr. O'Toole said, this, is, this isn't some sort of um, uh, opposite, the direct opposite of a 1619 curriculum. Okay, not at all. Instead, we're, we're focusing on, on what we think is, is true and, and the principle that we uh, that we apply here, and it's up to debate what what makes it in based on this principle. But 
the principle is what are the things that have most greatly uh, impacted the, the world of the student, that the student, the world that the student is going to live their lives. And, uh, you know, that's the principle we use to determine what makes it into the curriculum. And that means there's a lot of good things in American history. And, and we think the Amer good things in American history um, are present at the founding and are the things they endure over time um, compared to the bad things. But it also means that the, uh, the ways in which uh, we have failed as a country are, are taught and taught honestly. Um, so content is one area that, that kind of weighs out what we're teaching here. Uh, we also talk about pedagogy, advice for teachers. And, and this is for anybody on the call. Uh, you, know, you know, when you enter into a K-12 classroom, what should you be seeing, especially if you're studying about American history and civics? And uh, we think this, this should be a teacher-led classroom, but one that is dynamic, that is the teacher telling a story and telling the story by asking a lot of questions of students, um, questions that help the student tell the story alongside the teacher. It is dynamic and it pulls all these different resources together um, and, and it, it's aiming ultimately at, at a sense of wonder in the students, a wonder that propels them to more learning um, about their country and also a, a love of country. Uh, from, from there, I, there, you know, there are other things in the introduction to look at, um, including a, a section on success and what, what's going to be required um, for this to be, to be successful, um, and, and a section on the principles that, that uh, every teacher should be mindful of if they're going to be employing this curriculum. Um, but I'd like to move ahead and actually look at what something that the te a teacher would, uh, would receive. Now, this curriculum, uh, besides the primary sources we've included it and the sample tests and things like that, otherwise this is for, this is for teachers, um, whether it's a teacher in the classroom or a homeschool parent, um, you know, it's, it's for them to, to bring into, um, into their instruction. So I'm just going to show, walk, walk us through briefly a, a middle school history uh, lesson and what, what a unit is, how a unit is set up. Um, so here, for example, is a unit on the American founding, and we begin with uh, the different lessons and, and what they cover in each one and some pacing guidance, um, some overall ideas of why we should teach this, why students need to learn this, some the main ideas that to take away from the lesson, and then some preliminary thoughts on what teachers to consider as they begin planning for this. Um, we, we've done a lot of work, uh, the college has, vetting resources, including our own online courses. They're available for free to anybody in the public. And we align those with the things that are being taught. So if we look at a specific lesson, let's say this first lesson leading up to the, to the Declaration of Independence, um, you'll notice a few things that, that, we, that, we, uh, that we really like about, about what our schools do. And um, one of them is that we bring back the, the facts, the facts that students need to learn. Um, you know, they're, they're liberating, liberating in the sense in which you can separate fact from fiction. And so this includes things like people, geography and dates, time and place, uh, terms and topics. Um, those are all those are all part of it. And uh, but they're meaningful. They're thought out. They're not just there. It's good for students to memorize things and students memorize will memorize plenty in this curriculum, but it should be meaningful as well. And so students use this, this sense of time and place and these people uh, who are not just names, but real people who are just as real as the student themselves, having the same thoughts and desires, um, and, and dealing with similar circum uh, with similar questions in their lives. Um, we, we weave these all together into in a, in a dynamic fashion, uh, and then we add some things to it that that Hillsdale is is uh, particularly uh, focused on. Um, one is to for students to know things by heart. Um, uh, there are, there are a number of things here that. Uh, we think these are these are phrases and, and quotations and poems and songs that every American student should have the you know have the privilege to encounter and to know and to carry with them for the rest of their lives. Um, also, we have uh, you know we think that this should be told as a story. Um, and so we have and then within that story are smaller stories and we have these stories for the American heart. And again, these are things that teachers can share in their classrooms. Um, with students and uh, something that the student can carry with them and that, that it, it brings the brings the lesson alive for them and then finally we have these questions for the american mind and we think it's really important to ask good questions of students and not just questions on the who what when and where those are important and foundational um, but beyond that the why the how do you know this what do you think about this how you know what does this show us about human beings or our country or politics yeah, all those questions are right there and they're laid out um, for, for students to encounter. Um, we also, we don't shy, we, uh, our schools 
do not do high tech uh, classrooms. Uh, there's no one to one iPad ratios or anything like that. Uh, but a good place to use technology in history is through the use of images to project a, a map or a flag or a battle plan or or a figure from from history and to talk about that that image. And so we think that's a fitting place to to include in the curriculum. Um, and then we're the Hillsdale where we provide a little bit more guidance and in no way, no way, shape or form are we providing dictates with this. This is all guidance within certain parameters, but we really want teachers to take the curriculum and own it themselves to implement it. Um, but one section that is helpful is this keys to the lesson. And we don't do a script that tells teachers every single thing to say. Uh, that's 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 dictating to them. It's also robs the students of a great education. It's kind of insulting to teachers to think that all they, they're good for is reading a script. Uh, but instead, we have highlighted some things that we think can be tricky or that would make a really great lesson if if a teacher pays attention to them. And so this is these are the keys to the lesson, things that for teachers to think about as the, as they plan. Uh, the last resources that we that we offer to uh, teachers here uh, is a study guide on um, uh, that, that teachers can adapt based on what they're learning um, and sample tests that, that go go right along, uh, go right along with that. Um, if it's, if it's there. So these are things that teachers can employ in their classrooms and that that's a good way to determine what students should be should be learning. Um, and something that uh, we think is really important in all of this is uh, a series of primary sources that students should be reading from. This is the most direct contact with the past that brings the past alive for students. It's a direct insight into um, into the world and the thoughts and, and the deeds of, of the people who actually lived in this history. And so uh, we have a series of primary sources that we recommend. Um, and we broke it, we've given some basic background information that really helps students get into the particular moment in which this document uh, arises. And then we have it laid out so that uh, so that students can readily ac uh, access it and, and annotate it and make read it and make it their own. So there are um, plenty of, of these, of these uh, resources throughout the curriculum. Now, I think that uh, what do we do when we take all of this? Uh, what, you know, this is a K-12 curriculum. It's, it's for every grade level. Um, and how we've broken it down is by grade level bands, K through two, third through fifth grade, sixth through eighth grade or middle school, and ninth through 12th grade for high school. And uh, across that, they will study American history uh, since the Civil War, uh, four times, or uh, through the Civil War, four times, modern American history twice, not to mention two uh, whole things on uh, American civics and government. So it's a it's a robust curriculum, uh, uh, and and it ask it ask we, we put forward this is what we think an American child should study and to learn about their country. Um, now, Dr. O'Toole mentioned some things about you know uh, how do we handle the times when America has failed and things like that, and uh, we put them side by side. They're all there. It's part of the the story. Um, we do think that the good. Uh, endures in all this, and we do think the American uh, founding, and this is not a debatable point, but compared to any place else in the world at the time, or leading up to it, had no country been founded on principles such as America was, and then the successes and achievements that have been gained by ref referencing those principles are also unparalleled. And so, uh, but we don't put a lens on it. We don't put anything like that. It's 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 the, it's the his, it's the history. It's the truth. It's an honest account of, of the past. And when it comes to individuals in that, they're just as fallible as as we are nowadays. And it's good for students to see that about that. That's true not only of people in the past but of themselves. And so they see the heroic things they do and the ways in which they've come up short. Um, and they realize it's, it can be very difficult to make a total judgment in somebody's life or character. Um, especially in a negative uh, manner when you think that we have, in many ways, the sensibilities we have nowadays looking back are re the result of the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, so this is, this is an unbiased curriculum and we encourage people to just see for themselves, you know, uh, look into it. Um, you know, there's, we'll put it up against anything that's out there. And we think it's really a curriculum that can heal and unite America rather than uh, further inflame and, and divide it. And we think that's what students deserve. So. Uh, so that that's just a little bit of an introduction to what the curriculum entails and, and what it looks like. Um, you know, we at this point we'd like to open it up to uh, to your questions and um, and any thoughts you you may have. So uh, again, if you have any questions, put them into the Q and A box with your name and where you're from. Um, so.
uh, I think one, one first question, maybe Dr. Tull can take a stab at it and I can follow up if, if necessary. But uh, uh, Janie from Texas uh, is asking, you know, how does this, does this work in public schools? Uh, uh, you know, especially given the current political climate that's out there uh, and kind of as a follow up to that, you know, how does this fit with state testing and, and state standards? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, let me explain a little bit about how state standards work. Um, state standard, it depends on the state, but generally speaking, those are decided upon um, by some combination of the, of the governor's office, the legislature, and the Department of Education, or the state, you know, state Department of Education, they call it different things. Um, there are different procedures for it, but whatever, whatever the procedure, the standards are a set of general requirements that all public and public charter school students must, must reach. Um, and many of our schools are public charter schools, and so they, they meet the standards that are applicable to that state. Because the standards are by definition sort of a, a baseline requirement for what elementary and secondary age students must learn, there's actually plenty of time in the school day to do things that are beyond the standards. Um, especially if you use your time efficiently, as we do in classical schools, we teach bell to bell, um, students have a full school day all the way through 12th grade, and they learn the habits of mind and the, and the content knowledge that enable them to really do quite a lot in school. Um, one example is, uh, I don't know of a state that requires Latin, and yet all of the students in Hillsdale Classical Schools take Latin and reach proficiency in Latin, meaning translation ability, by the time they get to high school. Um, that's possible because we're just efficient with our time and we have kids who know how to do that and teachers who know how to do that. Um, before we work with a, with a new state or a school in a new state, we do an alignment between our curriculum, our scope and sequence, and the, um, and the state standards. And we don't go into a state unless we're confident that we can follow the law and also provide a classical education to these kids. Um, I have yet to see a state in which it is impossible. Um, it's, it's possible that there's a state out there in which it cannot be done, but I have yet to find one. Um, and so I, th I hope that's encouraging. Um, kids, kids can do this and it can be done under state law. Yeah, and the, um, you know, a lot of the standards that are out there, they're not in and of themselves always bad standards, but they leave the door open for a lot of bad things to be included uh, at the curriculum level, at the school level. And, and so, um, like Dr. Tool says, this far surpasses uh, a lot of the requirements that, that states have. Um, you know, and so, so it's definitely meant for public schools. You know, these charter schools that we, that we work with, um, those are public schools. Uh, and so, you know, so it, it, it certainly does. Given the political climate, um, you know, I think this, it's a, it's a question of, um, you know, who, who makes these decisions and, and how can this be used? And um, Rose from Florida had a, had a, has a similar, or maybe a question that's, that follows on this, which is how do you introduce this to your local school? And, that, and that's a really great question. Um, so one thing to do is to find out where curriculum de decisions are, are being made in your locality or in your state. Um, sometimes it's at the state level, but oftentimes the state sets out the standards and then they sometimes will recommend uh, certain curricula, but more often than not, they will let the, leave that up to the local district. And that's usually a superintendent or school board decision that, 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 make, that they make to determine what type of curriculum they're going to use. And so with that, those are the people that you may want to introduce this to. Um, and I think the introduction is a great way to start. Uh, the whole curriculum, when you add it all up across all those grades, and, and you know, we've only released the first two thirds of it. We're working on the final uh, units for the American history and that should be released in early 2022. Uh, but so far it's adding up to over 2000 pages, right? So you're not gonna wanna hand that to, to anybody who's uh, right off the bat, but the, but the introduction's uh, you know, 30 pages or so. And so that's, and that's can be geared a little bit more towards them. So I would advise, you know, I probably suggest that people download it, uh, print it off or, or send it, uh, you know, send the link um, to, uh, to school board members, introduce it at a school board meeting even. You could, you could submit it into the minutes, that'd be fine. Um, or talk with the superintendent, but do it politely, do it respectfully, ask people for their consideration. 
Uh, I think one of the things that uh, that we've realized out there is that there's been a lot of, uh, fi- you know, f- finally a lot of people have woken up to um, to the to the issues that are going on in education. Uh, we've we have, there's school choice is one of them, but also now what is actually being taught in the classrooms, and it's right for them to to notice these things that are awry, they're wrong for the country, wrong for our students. Um, but at, at a certain point, there's going to have to be an alternative put forward. Um, you need something positive to run on, to, to run on and to get to, to make a change. And so, and we think that our curriculum can fit that bill. Um, we don't know of anything that's quite like it out there. Uh, it's also based on real students and real classrooms. It's actually happening. Um, and so I would suggest uh, find out who it is that makes these curriculum decisions and, and, and you can recommend this to them. I also suggest that uh, any teacher anywhere can adopt, can in, use this for their own knowledge or to supplement what they're already doing. Um, that happens all the time in education that teachers will pull in things that are not necessarily uh, the, what, the, what, the school, the, what the school standard is, but that's fine. It's expected. It's called making your lessons better. So, um, so, and, and any teacher can do this. We already have teachers in over 1300 schools across the country who uh, have downloaded the curriculum for, for use in their classrooms. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, next question here. Uh, those are really great questions. Jennifer from California asks, how does a first time homeschool mom do this? seems like a lot of prep work and reading for the parents. Uh, Dr. Tool, do you want to uh, weigh in on that? Yeah, we're working hard on this. Um, more and more parents are wanting to supplement or maybe even take homeschooling into, into their own hands. And um, this curriculum is the beginning of a series of resources that we're putting together for homeschooling families. Um, for more, you can go and to learn about how this curriculum fits into the entire American classical program that we offered our schools. You can go to K12 at home, K12 at home.hillsdale.edu. There's a, there are a number of videos there for parents, whether you're a parent of a child in public school who wants to know, is this, is what my child's learning, you know, age appropriate and, um, you know, quality, whether you're a parent who's thinking about homeschooling or whether you're a parent who is already homeschooling, there's a lot of stuff there to introduce you to some elements of classical education. Uh, more is coming. We are working on adapting this K-12 program guide, our curriculum, for homeschooling use. And we're going to be piloting that next year and then releasing it, we hope, to the general public the following year. Um, in the meantime, there are a lot of resources out there that will help you homeschool your child or supplement your child's public or private school education. You can go to Hillsdale's online courses um, they're really good. They're, they're closely related to, if not identical, to the, the kinds of things that are in a classical education. And they're interesting to watch. They're beautifully produced, and they're taught by some of the best professors here at the college. And each lecture is just 20 or 30 minutes long. And so it's a great way to dip your toe into the classical world, shore yourself up on history or mathematics or whatever it is. And what you'll learn from that is... Um, You'll, you'll gather recommendations for further reading. And you can use that to, to you know, develop your own understanding and then gather, you know, and then use that with your child. It is true that um, homeschooling a child using a classical curriculum is a serious endeavor. Um, there's not a way to make it really easy. Uh, our goal is to make it really clear um, and then to give parents recommendations about how to make it work for their family. Some parents will join a co-op, they'll find other parents and they'll divide the teaching among themselves. Sometimes they hire a teacher to come in. Some parents will do it you know, within their own family. Uh, that's all a local decision. You're the one who knows your child. You're the one who you know, can figure out what works best for you. Our job is just to give you a place to start and that's right now K-12 at home. .hillsdale.edu. Yeah, and I'd add and just say that, um, you know, the best teaching depends on pe- the teacher knowing what they're, what they're teaching and letting the love of, of what they've studied and the love of sharing it with their student arise. And that goes for homeschool parents as well. And so, 
um, you know, I, I just say take a start at it someplace. It doesn't mean, you know, like I said, this this is guidance, not dictates. Uh, this does not mean you have to do every single thing that's in there. Uh, you know, start start where you can. Follow, you know, see where it goes. Follow uh, follow what you're what you're loving to learn and um, and and pull on that. So, you know, sometimes in our schools, sometimes um, especially in the first years of schools, math and literacy are uh, it's, it's they're very they're very important and it's important to get everybody on the same page and. Um, some days we say to teachers, look, if you get in there and you pull one of these read aloud books that we have from this curriculum and you read that aloud to your 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 class in an engaging manner and ask good questions of them, that's that's going to be a great, great start to that education. Um, so I just encourage don't feel, you know, there's a lot there, but we we want to put everything on the table. Uh, it's we it's really up to the teacher or the homeschool parent to to cut where they where they feel uh, is necessary to, to get it done. And if you're not homeschooling, um, you can still use this as Dr. Tool mentioned, as kind of a touchstone to compare to what your child is learning in school. Um, you know, so, you know, how does this compare to what they're actually studying um, in, in the classrooms? And, and that can be a, a good way to, to navigate that. Um, I, uh, next question, uh, Deborah from Connecticut. Uh, you know, ask how does this curriculum make uh, minority students feel comfortable with American history and and uh, and yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll I'll I can start off with it if Dr. Tool has anything to add. Uh, she she can. Um, you know, I I think uh, the the question itself may be a little bit of a a, a, a little off on, on where it's coming from. Um, and the reason for that is I think a lot of students, as with any story that they're entering into, and that's how we teach this principally as a story um, and a story in the past. They're, they're taught to be uncomfortable with American history because they've been told to be uncomfortable about American history by adults. And we don't tell the student what to think about anything in history. We present the history to them. And so I think the key here is everybody is looking at this uh, st step the back from history and then trying to put ourselves into the shoes of the characters who are there. Right. So it's no longer you who are in the, it, that you who are studying it, but you are part of, of that history and you're and you're in it and you're observing it and you're witnessing it as an objective bystander bystander there. Um, and insofar as things come up from there, then they're dealt with. But I think the, the main thing that we see here is that this is the story of human beings okay? the curriculum doesn't bring up race as a determining factor about why we study somebody okay, or or of the students themselves. Right? That, the, the key thing here is that these are all human beings who have a, the same human nature, who are striving for the similar things and who are equally uh, you know, capable of great things and also capable of awful things. And uh, we put everybody on, on that level, student, historical figures, teacher, that's our starting point. And I think that's a really healthy and the truthful way to, to begin approaching. I don't know if Dr. O'Toole has um, anything else that she may wanna add to that. No, I think that's great. So uh, thank you for uh, thank you for joining us this this afternoon. Um, you know we really value you taking the time to um, to learn more about Hillsdale College, Hillsdale College K twelve education, and the Hillsdale seventeen seventy six curriculum. Um, you know this uh, we're really excited about it. It's it's gaining a lot of traction, and uh, but we think that the main way for it to really be successful is by ordinary citizens to um, to care to to share it. Um, and to, to learn about their country themselves. And so uh, we really appreciate uh, your, your interest and support and